So today, for our expert interview, um, we have the pleasure of speaking with Dr. Doug Menon, who's going to share his thoughts on anxiety and emotion. So Dr. Menon received his PhD from Temple University, and after nine years on the faculty at Yale University, he joined the Department of Psychology at CUNY Hunter College as an associate professor. Dr. Menon has focused on treating chronic bouts of anxiety and mood disorders, and his work examines, first, the experimental and ecological delineation of behavioral and biological processes that contribute both to emotion reactivity and dysregulation and chronic anxiety, as well as co-occurring depression. Second, he looks at the development of an integrative mechanism-based emotion regulation treatment, which has demonstrated considerable efficacy thus far, especially in the realm of generalized anxiety disorder. And finally, he also examines biobehavioral mechanisms of reactivity and dysregulation whose changes mediate long-term symptomatic and functional outcome as a result of this intervention. In his work, Dr. Menon utilizes experimental paradigms centered on presenting emotional stimuli and context to individuals with pathological chronic anxiety and depression. His research has been funded by several organizations and institutes, including the National Institute of Mental Health, and he's published over 60 peer-reviewed empirical articles and book chapter, as well as editing two books. His work has been recognized by numerous awards, including the President's Fund for Faculty Advancement Award and the George N. Shuster Faculty Fellowship Fund from CUNY Hunter College, as well as the Senior Faculty Fellowship in the Social Sciences from Yale University. Dr. Bennon currently serves on the editorial board of several major journals and on the executive boards of the APA Division of Clinical Psychology and the Society for a Science of Clinical Psychology and is a member of the Scientific Council of the Anxiety Disorders Association of America. So I now turn to a very special Experts in Emotion interview with Dr. Doug Menon. So welcome, Doug. Thanks for speaking with us today. Hi, Jim. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to talk to you always. Mm -hmm. One of the things I want to start out asking you is just for you to tell us a little bit about the story as to what got you interested in emotion in the first place. Where did it all begin? Sure. Well, <laughs> emotion has always interested me. I mean, I think I was a strange child, but, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, but I, I was sort of fascinated by emotions at an early age. I mean, I remember uh, you know, viewing art at a young age and speaking about what emotions were being conveyed, conveyed in facial expressions looking at the tone of paintings. Um, my father, part of my, uh, what my father does is an artist, and I was, so I went to museums a lot, and I, and, and uh, but he's a, he, he's very technical, would focus a lot on, on form, I, I would focus a lot on, 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 on emotion, emotional expression, and I would do that in many ways, and um, even when, when I met people, uh, uh, even as a child, I only wanted to be a, either a psychologist or a cartoonist, <laughs> so, so emotions had a good chance of uh, uh, of capturing my attention, and they did, and and, I, and that really continued when I was in college. Um, you know, particularly uh, uh, in, the emotions of anxiety. Um, I I was fascinated. Uh, I also actually went went to uh, an alternative high school, and and uh, in that high school, I I, I uh, learned a lot about it. it. Was a lot about um about anxiety itself, and and. and Sort of really a view of anxiety that I, I've taken uh, even into my adult life about learning how to face fears and not allowing avoidance to rule one's life, uh, and that was very formative for me. And um, got extended a lot in college when I was in. Um, uh, just we really had a wonderful uh, a psychology program at Overland College, uh, and classes on anxiety by Al Porterfield, and clinical classes by Karen Sutton, and and they were really formative classes that sort of opened me up to to emotion at a time when. Not a lot of people were talking about emotion, um, uh, and really about ways that uh, emotions may be reflected. How basic uh, a basic science of emotions could be reflected in understanding uh, uh, different forms of, of psychopathology, and that was really one of the first places that I, I got introduced to that. Oh, it's a lovely story, and I'd love to ask you then about sort of where you are now in terms of asking some questions about the work you've been doing since then. Um, so you're so widely known for your influential work in delineating this beautiful model of emotion regulation and how it relates to anxiety disorders. And I just wonder if you could tell us a bit more about what you see as the special role of emotion regulation in understanding anxiety disorders, and I know in particular generalized anxiety disorder. Thanks, June. 
you know, emotions are, are central to the understanding of anxiety disorders. You know, we've there's a, a rich history uh, in many ways of of uh, examining emotional life. It's hard it's hard not to with a disorder that's defined so much by by uh, by emotions. Um, you know, Dave Barlow's influential work uh, uh, was really formative in, in looking at the differences between fear and anxiety, uh, and uh, so the proximity of a threat and, and how. Uh, uh, how those may relate to a, uh, a larger personality, negative affect personality condition. Uh, that work obviously is, is influential, is making a, a, a big difference today in how we think about uh, anxiety and mood disorders. Uh, also Peter Lang's work on, on, on multi-componential processing of subjective and, and behavioral and uh, biological components of, of anxiety were all very influential, I think, to the whole field. Um, but nonetheless, the field had sort of a focus really on overt behavioral markers. So it really, I think that's really comes from an, uh, uh, an, an early Skinnerian sort of view. Uh, Skinner really viewed emotions as sort of reifications and not true things. Um, cognitive theorists, uh, which were also influential in, in the anxiety disorders, uh, really looked at, at emotion as an epiphenomenon of cognition. So. So you know the affect science field was was uh, you know as as it was starting to burgeon, um, clinical the clinical field although largely dealing with uh, with emotions and and clearly uh, anxiety disorders dealing with emotions really what uh, really hadn't been looking at um, a functional view of emotions and understanding um, uh, what are the ways emotions were important uh, and how uh, that the, the functional nature of emotions might be playing into. Um, the type of dysfunction that we see in anxiety and mood disorders, particularly for disorders that we're with the distress or internal, where there aren't those overt behavioral markers, where we don't have uh, a bridge or a dog or even an internal, uh, internal physical experience uh, like we might see in panic. Uh, disorders like post-traumatic stress disorder and generalized anxiety disorder, really are distress disorders, that are in, in internal sort of um, experience, subjective experience disorders. Uh, and the work that really um, uh, moved me, and I think really moved the field in many ways, was the work of Tom Borkovic, uh, who really examined uh, the importance of how we cognitively respond to emotions like anxiety. Uh, and he showed that, that different internal experiences could functionally react to each other and become strengthened and reinforced. Uh, and processes like worry uh, which really he saw as really defensive response to an, to, to an emotion of anxiety that gets strengthened and, reinf uh, and negatively reinforced uh, as it reduces distress. So when people are able to worry, they're able to, uh, uh, they sort of uh, produce a loosely correlation that they're sort of solving something, solving a problem, and that makes it more likely for that worry to happen again. And that was really very groundbreaking in, in the field. And I think that affect science, this, this really... Uh, dovetail with affect science and I think the work of James Gross that really uh, 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 for many of us uh, allowed us to extend the work of Tom Borkovic uh, and look at how uh, emotions uh, are generated and then regulated in different ways, in attentional ways, in cognitive ways. Um, and I think a lot of this is not that different than the history that's in, in uh, uh, behavioral approaches to anxiety, uh, the work of Herbert Maurer. Uh, the idea that we we acquire uh, fears and anxiety associationally, and then uh, operantly um, reinforce them, re reinforce those fears through avoidance. But I think the affect science literature shows us about how those those uh, those stimu the stimuli responses can be internal uh, and can be strengthened by poor regulatory responses. So I think overall, though, you know that 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 sort of means uh, the importance of sort of exp expanding our work to really examine. Um, in more complex ways, uh, the ways emotion, emotions may generate uh, uncomfortable responses that we need to, to, to then regulate internally. So it suggests assessments that are biological, um, uh, be, uh, behavioral observation, uh, facial expression, and not just uh, task performance, not just self-reports of anxiety. I think the field has really been moving uh, in that, uh, on that more um, multi-method direction as a result. Thank you so much. I mean, it's so interesting to hear just about how you know, you think about these models of emotion and emotion regulation and anxiety and also that you said really nicely at the end in terms of how this can sort of um, guide the way we, you know, conduct clinical assessments of these, you know, disorders as well. 
this leads to one of the things that I think is most inspiring about the work you do, where you really you know, do this amazing job of translating findings from the laboratory into, you know, intervention-based approaches to treating and ameliorating, you know, symptoms of anxiety and suffering in individuals diagnosed with anxiety disorders. And I just wonder, you know, from your perspective doing this, especially with respect to generalized anxiety disorder, you know, what do you see as some of the most, you know, promising, you know, treatment targets that you would highlight in a treatment protocol focused on emotion regulation difficulties in, you know, generalized anxiety disorder, for example? Um, sure. Yeah, we're excited about uh, uh, sort of the horizon. Uh, it's an important time for, for treatment. Um, I think we've done very well with disorders such as, uh, you know, anxiety disorders, depression. Um, but there are a lot of people who suffer still and, and, and aren't getting better. And uh, I, the, the field has, has looked toward to ethics science to help us hone our, our treatments uh, and direct them to what the basic psychopathology may be uh, as we learn more about that as well, particularly for, just, for when anxiety and depression co-occur. And the treatment that uh, my collaborator Dave, Fre Dave Fresco and, my, and myself uh, develop in, in emotion regulation therapy really uh, is targeted to those people who have, you know, chronic forms of anxiety and recurring depression. Um, so this, uh, this particular comorbidity, whether it's uh, driven by more of the chronic anxiety and more the, 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 the recurring depression at the time, is, is very detrimental and, and, and is resistant to both psychosocial and pharmacological treatments. And so in our treatment, we, um, we're really encouraging clients, like any, like any anxiety treatment, to face what they fear. But with this type of anxiety mood presentation, often that's a moving target. And as I mentioned, there's not as many of these overt markers. Um, so, but what is constant for these individuals is a need to sort of protect themselves and a need to sort of uh, manage risk over reward. And this is really, and so we really draw from the basic motivation literature um, that's a part of ethics science um, that really talks about approach avoidance conflicts. And we, and we argue that the basic human state is to want to uh, avoid bad things and, and try to achieve good things. Uh, and one of the problems may be that when we thought about exposure in this kind of disorder and we thought about facing fears, we often do it um, not in the context of a reward. And, and for these individuals, sort of, just like all of us, our everyday experiences really are, uh, we're not really uh, running from tigers, but we're uh, managing uncertain outcomes that have the potential for reward, but also the potential for, for bad things to happen. And so we, we are interested in really exposing individuals to that, that conflict, the conflict of wanting, wanting things to go well, but being okay with things that don't go well, and the experience of both. And we do that by improving skills and training individuals in skills that we really draw from the basic affect science literature. Um, you know, uh, basic skills and, um, and really honing. We have a lot of great uh, skills work in cognitive treatments, but the ability to sort of look at affect science and hone them uh, has been an exciting uh, direction for, for, for Dave Fresco and I in our work. We particularly look at um, uh, targeting attention, attentional process, processes, uh, targeting the ability to accept and allow emotions, to create a mental distance or a cognitive, uh, metacognitive distance, and to work on effectively reappraising emotions. And, and those are sort of four basic, basic skill groups that we use to help individuals engage these sort of approach avoidance contexts. Uh, in order to sort of open up and have more behaviorally flexible lives, they tend to have very behaviorally constrained lives, and this, this, this we, we have seen helps them not only feel better, but also engage parts of their life that they haven't been engaging. And it sounds like some of these core processes that you're targeting can be used both in the context of anxiety disorders, but that it sounds like there's this nice sort of transdiagnostic application across disorders as well that suffer from emotion regulation difficulties too. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. I think you know we're, we're a lot of our work. We're stepping beyond the, the classic uh, DSM four diagnostic system. Mm -hmm. At the same time, we think that that you know we, we sort of respond to the call of NIMH uh, uh, in the importance of treatment personalization. We don't think everything's going to work for everyone. So with our treatment, we think it, it particularly works for these uh, chronic anxiety mood uh, mm -hmm. uh, patients, uh, patients that often we, you know may have uh, a neuroticism or negative affect component. Uh, and are highly, highly reactive to emotional events. Um, uh, those are the ones that, I, that we think we're, that it's, it's most useful for. Thank you. 
So the last question I wanted to ask, I mean, in addition to delineating this beautiful conceptual model of generalized anxiety disorder and translating these scientific findings to actual treatment interventions, your work has also adopted this really, you know, rigorous experimental approach to examining psychophysiological markers um, of anxiety and the way in which it can help us understand some of the processes related to emotion and emotion regulation. And I just wonder if you could tell us a little bit more about some of the findings that you found when adopting this, you know, psychophysiological approach to try to delve in and understand what, what might be going awry in individuals with anxiety. Yeah, yeah, you know, I, I think it, the, it, 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 our work has, 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 has been one of the groups that's sort of accentuated, uh, uh, you know, the importance, certainly your work as well has done this for bipolar disorder. And, and uh, you know, where we've seen, you know, that, if we didn't use a, 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 a multiple methods uh, assessments, we would miss out on the, the full picture, and that's true for uh, the disorders that 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 we've been studying, particularly generalized anxiety disorder, where we see that subjectively we might not see uh, a difficulty in in regulating different emotions, but physiologically, found some interest. We've had some interesting findings where in terms of generalized anxiety disorder, when when confronted with emotional stimuli, particularly video stimuli. Uh, they, their, their physiological responses look quite different uh, uh, than uh, than uh, individuals with uh, who don't have, who don't have uh, generalized anxiety disorder. Uh, whereas individuals who don't have generalized anxiety disorder uh, are more likely to uh, uh, sort of be in a, uh, a non prepared state uh, when when they when they're confronted with a more uh, a, a more emotional stimulus might then get that defensive preparatory response. It's really reflected. Um, in the par parasympathetic nervous system and in, 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 in indices of heart rate variability. Uh, and we see that, that there's this uh, with, what's called a vagal withdrawal uh, during, that, uh, during that period, uh, that emotional period, and then a vagal re uh, uh, rebound um, afterwards. And we see, we see sort of this nice quad quadratic effect for people who have a normative response. And that just shows flexibility. It shows uh, an, 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 an ability for individuals to... Uh, you know, to respond to that when they need to, and then return to a quiescent state when, when, when possible too. And um, and when we ask them, uh, when we ask these individuals to um, to utilize known strategies to help them, how to accept their emotions or think about them differently, the normative individuals are able to utilize that and, and increase that that parasympathetic response effectively in the recovery period. They're able to go to use the, the skill to sort of return to a to a a, a flexible place. Um, for people with generalized anxiety disorder, we see the exact opposite. When they when they engage these strategies, they actually get worse. Their uh, their their physiological system becomes more rigid, and, and they enter a more defensive state. So what that suggests to me is that what we think might work for individuals who aren't you know in 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 this this more emotional distress place might work the same way. And it suggests mm -hmm. that interventions that are more about uh, 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 that are less verbal, less elaborative less taxing and uh, uh, resource depleting may be better for individuals who have sort of busy minds and the work of mindfulness and, and uh, body awareness and, and, so, uh, uh, and, and the like may be important first steps for these individuals more so than elaborative cognitive approaches. Thank you so much. So as you're sort of thinking about some of the work you've done and you've already alluded to where it might be going next, um, I have just sort of the general broad question of where do you see the the field of emotion research headed at this point? Well, you know, I think yeah. I said it. You know, the, one of the lovely things about it is that it's mm -hmm. it's headed in so many directions. It's it's being you know, it's for for those of us who are, you know have been around a little bit. It's it's amazing to see how much affect science has pervaded uh, you know psychology and not just clinical psychology. And so that's exciting. Um, I think the one of the one of the, one of those directions that is really exciting to me. Is is how much is how the connection between basic science, psychopathological science, and intervention science are, are tightening, and we're we're really sharpening our approaches to treatment based on what we see in the lab. But I think it's important to note, to state that this is you know which is often talked about trans translation a translational science. I think it's important to say that this is a two way street, and I think we mostly think about it that that clinicians have something to learn from basic. Affect science, but I think, um, and, they do. and, and and we get we have, we have we have tighter targets when we know when we understand how normative functioning is in an, in, an, in an effective process and how it goes awry. But it's important as well the other way for affect scientists to learn about the phenomenology of conditions from clinical scientists yeah. and 
understand what we see in our labs and in, in, you know, in a clinical setting um, so that we're really targeting what people are suffering with. And we're, you know, and I've always, one of the things that's been important in my work is that we, that we skew closely to the phenomenology of individuals who are suffering so we can help them with that suffering. So then, Doug, when you're talking with students who are thinking about embarking in the field or study of emotion, fear, anxiety, what kind of advice do you give them? Yeah, I mean, I think relatedly, I, I, I would say don't follow fads of what's hot and exciting. You know, that changes. Uh, I, you know, I think um, on one hand, don't shy away from difficult subjects uh, such as neuro, neurobiology or complex multivariate statistics. Uh, clearly, these are tools that are going to be really important for particularly for the study of psychopathological conditions. Uh, on the other side, though, don't don't just study something because the, don't not study something because it's hard and complex. You know, uh, we we've tended to shy away from things that are difficult to understand and in favor of things that we could explain tight in tight ways. Uh, but suffering is hard and complicated, uh, and if we're really going to be able to improve our ability to 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 help people suffering a lot. Um, we're going to need to put our scientific attention towards that, and so I, you know, I think it's, I think pick up, you know, uh, address that challenge as well, uh, and pick up a topic of interest and understand it from multiple levels: theoretical, empirical, even phenom phenomenological. You know, um, speak to others who have different expertise. You don't need to do everything yourself. Um, there's a world of influence uh, in a given area, uh, and open yourself up to different ideas. Um, and we learn the most like, when we come together to share knowledge. So. Uh, that's, I think when we do that, that's the best chance of really you know, finding the answer, getting, getting that key to the door of, of making a difference in people's lives. Mm. Thank you so much for speaking today with us, Doug. Really appreciate it. You bet you, and it's been a pleasure. And this concludes our Experts in Emotion interview with Dr. Doug Menon from the City University of New York Hunter College. Thanks, Doug.